name is Joe Rickland. I'm the communications director for the city of Hermantown. And uh, similar to the two meetings, public meetings we've done on the community recreation initiative earlier tonight, we're going to focus on uh, a third component project, the indoor sheet of ice for the new arena, um, and answer questions about that, both how the uh, workings of the referendum, the questions, uh, and what's possible with local option sales tax, as well as uh, having our folks from Cross Anderson and DSGW talk about the uh, design pieces and what um, preliminarily what we're going to look for uh, and what's possible with uh, what we're voting on in November. Um, we've got a handful of folks in the audience, and we know folks will be watching this online, so we've got some questions already teed up, but we're going to dive into a bit of the presentation out of the blocks. Let me call that up quick. And for folks at a high level who are experiencing this for the first time, there's there's kind of more of a long history to this than, than people are sometimes aware of with the Community Recreation Initiative. There's workings on both uh, individual projects like the arena, the trails, and Fickner that have been in the works for nearly a decade. Um, uh, but the idea of being able to fund one or any of these projects with local option sales tax really started to coalesce uh, in about 2018, 2019. If there were two kind of driving reasons for that, one was that the success that we were about to experience and have experienced since then, funding the Essential Wellness Center uh, in that manner uh, and getting feedback from folks at the legislative level that um, the success that we were having and the partnerships that we were making uh, and leveraging local option sales tax in that way were being viewed as a positive across the state. And the second was, again, those kind of three individual projects and the supporters of that finding and working and to find creative ways to make something that was always out of reach, you know, a citywide trail system, a reimagining of a, of a more central park at Fickner Park and a much needed uh, sense of a second ice or a second uh, more upgraded arena. Um, we're kind of able to find their way to, to the city at the same time we were looking at local option sales tax. A, uh, in 2019, uh, which is when my position was hired at the city, this was one of the first projects that we were uh, faced with. How do we uh, build something as an idea that would get legislative approval to give residents a chance to vote on it? Um, and that was given uh, careful consideration by the state legislators and put on to the ballot uh, approval to put on the ballot right at a meeting that was probably one of the last ones before they closed down uh, everything for COVID. Um, so that put a big giant pause button on everything, uh, not only in regards to this particular referendum, but so many other things in the community. Um, it was an easy move forward for the legislature to then include it in this year's uh, uh, ballot. Um, but obviously there was some impacts and changes during that time that I'll talk about today. Um, but if we dial it down specifically today, uh, the local option sales tax referendum on this particular question, and again, I'll, I'll talk about all three questions today, um, but again, we're focused on the, the potential indoor sheet of ice today, um, allows for $10.84 million for the additional indoor sheet of ice. Um, a lot of the discussion about um, the changes that have happened since this was originally proposed to the legislator have been about the change in cost uh, and the change uh, in what it would make to construct some of the things that made sense in 2019, 2020, compared to 22, 23, where if this passes, that's when some of those things would come into, into favor. So there were two different bills uh, throughout the session this year, one in the tax bill that allowed for increases of around 10 to 15% on each one of the component projects of the Community Recreation Initiative. And then also specific to uh, the arena, because it is a unique project that has a different type of regional impact, uh, upwards of $4 million in bonding. That laid in the bonding bill. Uh, obviously, those did not move forward at the legislature, even though there was quite a bit of talk about it. And at this point, obviously, a special session went from highly unlikely to whatever is more highly unlikely than highly unlikely. Um, but those questions still come up. So we did, you know, it's important for folks to know that both of those options were existing in our state legislature and folks were working toward that, but it didn't, it didn't come to fruition. One of the other regular questions that comes up uh, are the ballot questions themselves. Also in the tax bill was the idea that we would combine or we would be able to combine the community recreation initiatives down to one question. That'll allow for a lot more clarity in what we're doing and, and both from the city perspective and from the community perspective, we've always looked at this recreation initiative as one thing with three components. The, the driving force behind this that was also kind of the same driving force behind the Essential Wellness Center was the idea that uh, St. Louis County is one of the bottom quartile counties for health outcomes. 
And so kind of attacking that statistic in a positive through the wellness center and through uh, outdoor recreation opportunities is how we feel like we can move that as a whole. So certainly makes sense to look at these as three separate things, but we've always looked at them as uh, one when we went through the process. Uh, changes from, you know, like 18, 19 into 21, 22, uh, in the laws and that the legislature enacts it is why that has to be now three separate questions. Again, in the tax bill, we were hoping that there would be a change to make it one, but no special session, no tax bill, no bonding bill. So at this moment, still three separate questions. For clarity's sake, one, two, or three of the projects can pass. They're not linked together. It's not an if this, then this, or these two equal this third one, two, or three, or zero can pass. But it's important for folks to realize that whether one, two, or three pass, the sales tax increase will be the same. So it will be a half percent increase um, to our sales tax, regardless of whether it's just the trails or just Ficker Park or just the arena. Um, the change between those, because obviously those are different dollar amounts to bring those projects to fruition, will be the time that the sales tax uh, is in effect. Uh, there's definitely been some banter about how taxes never go away. That is also different, a, a law change in regards to how local option sales tax works now as this sales tax will be sunset as part of this. So when the projects reach their point where they've matured enough and we've been able to pay off the bonding that the city council is likely to ask for to allow us to start these projects right away, um, that will be the sunset on this. So current sales tax would return when this expires. Um, for folks who are, uh, you know, sales tax wonks and are really into this stuff, they might know that um, our sales tax is lower than our largest neighbor right now. Duluth has a sales tax that is a half percent higher than ours. Uh, if this goes forward with any of these projects or all three, we would then be equal to Duluth. So concerns about People making some different choices in their shopping behaviors are certainly, uh, you know, a consideration in this process. But in this case, we won't be unlike our largest neighbor. We'll actually be coming to the same level as them. And some folks, I, I'm a Duluthian, they added that half percent sales tax in the not too distant past for Duluth. Um, they focused it on some pretty specific street repairs. Um, so that'll give you an idea of what local option sales tax can do. So where they're fixing a few streets and we're doing that on the city side, this is a chance to kind of impact community-wide, um, some health initiatives and some health opportunities and some recreation opportunities with this half percent. In the blue box that you can see up on the screen, it, let's get a little bit specific about the possibility of the indoor sheet of ice, the new arena, uh, the economic impact. Uh, we did a study with the University of Minnesota Duluth at the start of this uh, kind of possibility of this, even before it was on the ballot. The economic impact of adding a second indoor sheet of ice, uh, allowing uh, folks like Haha, ha, I have more tournaments to offer broader participation, not just for folks in our community, but outside, uh, is expected return of more than $2 million annually. Uh, so that's a pretty positive economic return, uh, even compared to the other two projects. A little tougher to measure that with, you know, Fickner Park and the trails, but obviously in this case, we're able to do that a little bit. Um, current arena does not meet the community needs. Uh, again, there's a bit of subjectivity to that, but it is a fact that we do have families who have approached us on the city side, and I know I've talked to the hockey community and the school community quite a bit, that there is challenges in that we're uh, finding ice time in other counties as far as Carleton, other communities and states, and Superior to be able to meet the needs of uh, families operating in the ice. Uh, a lot of that has to do with the growth of the sport, primarily in the girls' side over the last several years, but we also have adults in the community who grew up playing hockey um, and it's still a big passion of theirs and they don't have a chance to really get on the ice at reasonable hours. So so uh, our arena has done a great job of, of serving the needs of our community as it uh, grew, but they're, they're, pr they're pretty active and pretty loud and, how, or, and pretty clear about how maxed out they are. Uh, there are folks that want to be participating in this uh, experience that are simply timed out based on the size of the indoor ice we have right now. Uh, finalizing a partnership with the school and works in a way that works best for the school and resident needs. One of the questions that has come up through this process is, hey, when will we know exactly down to the nuts and bolts how this works with the school? And we're still ironing that out because it's a big commitment, and a big partnership. But on the city side, some parts have become more clear. Uh, and that's kind of exciting because we've always wanted to do this in a way that fits with the school and their needs first. And that 
in turn will kind of flow right to the residents. So if it ends up being a situation where the ownership of the arena is best for the school, that's the direction we would want to go as a city. Or if it's best to have a joint powers agreement and the school feels that way, that's the way we want to go. If it's best for us to own both arenas, we've got a lot of openness to that. Because the bonding bill didn't go forward, there's a lot less strings attached to us what we can do in the city. If the bonding bill had gone forward, then there would be more statewide requirements about how this plays itself out. So now we're able to engage the school on greater discussions that serve them not only over the long term, but in the short term, will they make decisions about um, how they want this to go. So the partnership's been fantastic in terms of figuring it out. It is not uh, inked down today, but nobody in the process is worried that it wouldn't be. Um, so if the, uh, uh, particular project here passes, um, we'll definitely work to that and it'll end up in a way again that works for the school and residents. The final piece that I that comes up pretty regularly, whether folks are comfortable asking about it or not, um, or at least just kind of bantering about it online is that hockey gets everything. And I think that that uh, is, is a little bit of a, a challenging piece to consider because of the notoriety and success that some of our hockey teams, boys consistently going down to state and being champions, girls not joining them in that. Uh, level of consistency. But it is important to note that the city provides only $3,000. That's the only commitment that actually exists from the city to our hockey program. And that covers water for the outdoor rinks that are not only used by the school and those teams, but community-wide. Um, it's the same amount, the $3,000 that we provide in water for uh, Stebner Park for the soccer fields uh, and the soccer uh, folks in uh, in their season. It's not dissimilar to the same uh, amount of money and support that we provide for baseball and softball and Rose Road Field and stuff like that. Um, so certainly it's easy to see a team that's on the front page of the uh, sports and the news at times to see as something that has a lot. Uh, but in reality, a lot of their success is really simply because they've been successful. Um, there isn't a extra bit that is happening for them that isn't happening for soccer or baseball or some of the other community groups that we support. Um, so it's nice to kind of clear some of that up on the front end. Um, when we talk about the project as a whole, uh, again, three component projects, the trail system, which some folks have some experience about, and we might talk about today if folks are interested because they've already had some experiences on the Boulder Trail. Uh, and some of that that's been open through grant funding, uh, the Central Park area and Fickner Park area, re-turfing and reimagining some of that. But today our focus is on the additional sheet of indoor ice. Uh, I've got two folks with me, Chad Ronchetti from Krauss Anderson and Eric Lagergren from DSGW, um, who are also going to walk through this. Chad, I'll put you on the spot first. Um, you know, this is a little bit different project than the other components in that, you know, as a city, we've built trails. We know how to do that. We feel really comfortable we can accomplish that you know, as we go forward, should this pass. Um, the park, we've reached out for a degree of partnership with um, NCE, SAS, and some of the design pieces, but an arena is a different entity. It's a different monster. Um, and we see that obviously in the cost uh, associated with it. So um, we went through an RFP process to select a partner that ended up being a, a, per, a group that would guide us through that. And that was Krause Anderson, your firm. So if you could tell us a little bit about how you look at the project as a whole, the work that you're doing, and how that fits with both, obviously this project, but uh, kind of branches into the other parts as a whole. Sure, uh, Krause Anderson Construction, yes, went through the competitive qualifications process uh, in partnership with DSGW, the design partner. Uh, we were selected as a construction management firm uh, for our experience in uh, the construction of recreational facilities and specifically sheets of ice and also community event centers. So we, we've constructed uh, over 400 recreational facilities and, and 41 sheets of ice and 62 community events centers, including Bemidji, the Duluth Heritage, uh, recently the Iron Trail Motors up in Virginia, uh, also Grand Rapids Civic Center. So uh, our experience um, uh, would come to bear should the public decide to uh, vote yes and, and um, and get this additional sheet of ice built. Uh, the expertise that we bring to bear for you, you know, cost estimating throughout the entire project as we as we iterate through designs, um, you know, systems analysis, making sure the correct systems are fitted properly for the arena, and, and that's that's you know, again, reaching into our experience of, of additional sheets of ice and what those systems require, uh, making sure that things are on schedule, making sure that things are within the budget identified. You only get so much out of the sales tax, right? So how do we then make sure the value engineering is, is and 
systems analysis and working with the design team to make sure that uh, we can actually meet the budget provided because there is no extra money you have what you have. So, uh, and then also that things are on, on time and on schedule so that uh, the folks can, the kids can start not start playing here instead of staying up until 11 o'clock at night to make sure they're getting their ice time. So um, that's, that's the expertise we were brought on. Four, uh, we partnered with DSGW because we have a long-term um, partnership with them, having done multiple arena projects, and I, I don't know the number, but multiple arena projects across the state in partnership with them. So that that is the collaborative relationship we have, and it, it um, is efficient in communication uh, and efficient in, in uh, design and cost estimating and scheduling. scheduling. So um, that's, that's us. Perfect. And Chad, you're at 10... 10.84 is a locked in number and we'll talk more about what that means in terms of the vote and what folks can do to unlock more. Um, but that's kind of the challenge as we talk about Eric designing something that um, fits with kind of the, I don't want to say the bare minimum requirements, but should this pass, there's 10.84 million. If there's uh, philanthropic opportunities, then there becomes more to the program than that. So let's take a look at what DSGW has put together already and walk us through um, what we're looking at here, Eric. Absolutely. Uh, thank you. Um, well, first of all, uh, in the last couple of months, our, our team of Gross Anderson DSGW uh, has had multiple conversations with uh, city and arena staff and, and worked through some high level uh, design conversations uh, to come up with a concept in front of you today. Um, and really, the, the conversations have revolved around uh, kind of two main design goals or philosophies. One, uh, to Kind of improve the uh, first impressions and the visitor and the user experience over what the existing facility offers um, and the second to, to increase the quality and equity and availability of, of locker room team room spaces and, and other facilities within that building um, so i think kind of a good way to, to to hit on those items is to is to walk through the the concept layout that we have here um, and as you saw in that last image um, uh, the arena is really at the geographic center of a lot of recent improvements to the facilities, the schools, uh, the essential wellness center. And as such, uh, it, it makes sense if there's an opportunity uh, with adding a second sheet of ice to uh, bring focus to that corner of Ugstead and Arrowhead and to have a, an, an entrance that is the clear main entrance that brings in a lot more daylight and works better for the flow uh, of spectators, visitors, and, and players alike. And so with that in mind, uh, the plan in front of you today um, is oriented with north uh, off to the right, uh, Ugstead Road along the bottom, Arrowhead Road along the left-hand side. And, and the, the thinking is that the primary entrance would be oriented towards Arrowhead Road off a of pedestrian plaza situated at that corner to get cars out of that main entry area and, and make that more conducive to the the flow of folks around these different uh, facilities here. Uh, when you enter that main entrance, um, we would anticipate a two-story uh, open lobby, open concourse area. And uh, at this point, players and spectators to facilitate that better flow kind of go in two different directions. Uh, for spectators, as you'll see on the, I don't know if you want to skip ahead to the mm -hmm. second level plan here. We'll come back to the first, uh, but for people who are, who are spectators, uh, they would then go up a, a monumental staircase uh, in that open lobby and filter through an open concourse um, to what we call top-loaded bleacher seating. Now, what is that? That is basically to get to your seat, you're approaching from that upper concourse level and coming down the steps to your seat rather than walking in front of the first couple rows. Uh, and that helps to create that premium uh, premium experience in the in that main competition sheet and and just to kind of I should take a step back here uh, on both of these plans the gray area is the existing building uh, that sheet presumptively would become uh, kind of a secondary sheet of practice sheet where most competition varsity events would be played on the new sheet towards the towards the bottom of the page um, so to kind of talk about that uh, we can go back to the first floor here. We'll talk a little bit about uh, uh, kind of increasing uh, the quality of the locker room and team room spaces. In the current building, um, 
as, as well maintained as it is, uh, there's a little bit to be desired, as you touched on with some of the locker rooms in there. There's no two locker rooms are the same. There's there's some that are on the second level, not on the sheet or not on the level of of competition. And as you can imagine, that that could be a challenge uh, when you're dealing with ice skates. And so uh, our, our proposal would be to have all locker rooms and team rooms located on grade level on the same level as the ice. And when I talk about locker and team rooms, essentially that breaks down locker rooms. Uh, we're talking about what you typically think of uh, in, in a varsity type locker room, permanent lockers, sinks, uh, toilets, showers, team room on the other hand uh, would be a room designed 25 to 35 uh, kids that are in there getting ready for an event um, with benches, coat hooks, and the diff the primary difference being that uh, shower and, and restroom facilities are are arranged differently throughout the space. They might be shared between two uh, concurrent uh, team rooms or there could be individual single occupant type shower rooms and restrooms uh, throughout that locker area. So that's kind of the big picture uh, from a locker room and team room standpoint. Um, some of the other uh, pieces of the puzzle that help improve that those first impressions and that user experience are number one, uh, we're showing the ice operation. So the ice plant and the uh, Zambonia resurfacer parking relocated to the north side of the building, which is truly the back side of the building to allow that Arrowhead Road side to be the, the, the face of, of the facility and to be the face of the activities that are, that are going on in here. Um, along with that, uh, by removing the ice plant from that part of the building in the upper left-hand corner of the page, uh, there's space where a dry land training room could be built out. Um, and then above that, on, on the second floor, there's ample opportunity to, to fill in facility offices, possibly have a meeting space that could be uh, rented out for, for various events. Um, so at a high level, again, these things are all to improve that access to, to quality spaces. Um, and, and a big part of this project will be finding that right balance between how much of it do you build new especially with locker rooms and how much do you renovate within that, that good square footage uh, in the existing building. Um, I think from, a, from that first impressions and, and, and entrance standpoint, we also have an image uh, today. Uh, the question might be asked, you know, what could this possibly look like? Well, we don't know exactly, but uh, some of the themes of trying to uh, complement what's already happen in terms of improvements in the community with the wellness center across the street and, and, and around this area. Um, we could bring in some wood, some concrete, a lot of glass to bring some daylight in on that, on that new front entrance and on that south side of the building. Um, but by and large, uh, everything we're talking about here is, is in, intended to, again, complement those improvements that are already taking place and, and create a higher quality facility for, for the community. Perfect. Thank you, Eric. As we kind of think about some of the Q&A pieces that we'll dive into in a little bit, but one of the things that I mentioned and Chad mentioned was, you know, the difference between 10.8, 4 million and some other number. Um, and that's where DSGW has built in some flexibility because it, it's really important to be clear that the, uh, the referendum in November has set numbers within each question and set amounts per each project as approved by the legislature. Um, the questions themselves can be a little bit laborious. They're available on our website um, to be able to get comfortable with them. And I'll be doing a bunch more community outreach pieces to get people comfortable with what they're looking at when they get in there. Um, but the reality is, is that those are set numbers. So on all three projects, and especially this one, there's an opportunity for philanthropic support, um, whether it's in terms of naming rights, whether it's in terms of uh, advertising, whether it's in terms of additional amenities um, that the city is working on both with internal and external partners to make that happen. So some of the discussions in the community be about what's possible. Um, in some ways, there's a limit because of what we've got in sales tax dollars. And in some ways, there's not a limit in terms of what people are interested and passionate about uh, making come true. Um, we will have more information and news as those folks step forward closer to the election and as those pieces are being able to be solidified, but they're also likely to be opportunities that come post-election. Um, things like uh, trail experiences are, are probably something that will come over time all the time. Um, something like 
naming an arena is something you do once, you know. So some of those pieces are kind of fall on different calendar pieces, but um, but that process is already in play. And if there are folks who are interested in uh, reaching out or being connected to that, um, we've had a couple of different groups approach me at the city level, and that's the best way to start. If there's uh, passion about being able to make the power of people's votes even more powerful here and to add to these amenities, the best spot to reach out uh, is to me at the city. So again, as I mentioned at the beginning, there's a couple of key questions before we open it up, both uh, here and a couple of questions that have been passed along. Uh, the first and foremost, again, is one, two, or three questions, uh, whether one, two, or three projects go through, the sales tax will be the same. Uh, that sales tax, uh, let's talk about that. We just today got the final uh, uh, report back from the University of Minnesota Extension offices. Uh, from the uh, Center of Community Vitality for the research that they've done on sales tax in our community. And the at least 75% number held and actually went up a little bit. And what that means is at least 75% of all of the sales tax in Hermantown is paid by non-residents. All right. So that's important because anytime we talk about tax, one, that's definitely going to impact resident pocketbooks. But in this particular case, we can use the Essential Wellness Center as an example since it's already in existence. That's a project that's been funded entirely with sales tax. And 75% of that funding has come from non-residents, folks passing through Hermantown, spending money in Hermantown, but it is supporting a Hermantown entity. Um, as that sales tax increases, that's not expected to change. Uh, the dollars that are expected to be raised as we budgeted for this type of piece not only made the legislature comfortable enough to allow it to be out there on the ballot for, ballot for people to decide, but are actually budgeted in a way where we're likely to be able to pay them off in advance. The wellness center is already well ahead of where we expected it to be in terms of sales tax abilities to pay that down. So to be clear, 75% of our sales tax is paid for by folks who don't live in Hermantown. Uh, as we get into a little bit of what this feels like at the individual level, um, because sales tax is unlike other taxes, you don't get a bill, you don't get a bill like in your property taxes, which won't change at all for any of these projects the same way uh, that did not for the Essential Wellness Center. Um, but what it does mean is on the items that are sales tax eligible, and it is a robust list, which we have on our website of normal purchases that do not qualify for sales tax, gas, groceries, some of the day-to-day -day items are not impacted by this at all. Um, but if you do buy something that is sales tax eligible and you spend $100, the cost now would be 50 cents more. Um, based on what we learned today from uh, the University of Minnesota, if this tax applied equally to all Hermantown residents, which we know, of course, it would not, um, because the amount that you would shop at a place like Menards or Slumberland or Fleet Farm is going to vary person to person. Um, but the average impact annually, should this have passed years a year ago in 2020, would have been $33.42 per resident. So your annual contribution as a resident in Hermantown uh, if this was a sales tax that was in place uh, before today, it would be $33.42 more. Um, if you're a person who's, of course, on a on a uh, set income, that's a much more palatable number than has been thrown around. And if you aren't purchasing items for which this applies, it, not, it would not hit you. We know we have folks in this community who do spend uh, greater uh, time and greater energy and greater resources at places like Fleet Farm and Menards, where some of these uh, uh, higher tax dollars come in, and they obviously are providing more than that $33. So again, it's not equal across our entire community, but if you boiled it down to a number, that's what it is. Um, and again, if you spend $100 on a tax eligible item, that uh, cost for that would be 50 cents more. And again, I should also reiterate, it would be the same now as what you would pay for that item in Duluth, um, as opposed to a different cost. The uh, Community Recreation Initiative, this particular portion, the last piece that I want to remind folks about is that uh, oftentimes when we think about hockey in our community, we think uh, very much about our high school teams and their champions, uh, both on the boys and girls side, um, but we do not often think about uh, the countless youth uh, kids who play in these types of programs and actually a surprising number of old guys uh, who are still hoping to stay healthy. Uh, and uh, use sheets of ice that have become uh, kind of in demand. So, so sometimes, again, I think the success of, of some of our high school teams kind of overshadows the reality of what this particular uh, community entity is facing. Uh, any 
questions, comments, suggestions, anything that we can dive deeper on here uh, related, let's start with related to either the arena or the sales tax initiative and the operation of it as a whole. Yeah, so the question, you know, in case you didn't hear it online was, you know, based on this new facility, regardless almost of how it gets designed, it's going to cut into some parking. What what kind of uh, ramifications of that and what are the fixes for that? Eric, I'm going to let you answer it first, but then I'll kind of come at it from the way that we've been talking about it. And that's a that's an excellent question. And, and that hasn't been looked into in a lot of detail yet. Um, but what we have talked about is that, yes, no matter what expansion is proposed, it's going to cut into some of the existing parking. Um, there is some space on site to create some new parking. Um, there's also some potential, you know, existing spaces at the high school and at the uh, wellness center, which, you know, during game times uh, could potentially be available for use and, and some new connections, easier pedestrian connections to those be made. But that conversation kind of needs to happen at the, at the next level of our design process. And what that looks like on our side is obviously we know there's, there's kind of like how you dream of it working and then how people actually utilize it. And I think of big games where I've driven by and there's countless cars parked up and down the road um, and it's functional, but not ideal. Uh, and in essence, part of what Eric was talking about at the beginning is, is that we want to make an experience happen for people differently than it has been before. And so what it's not ideal then to have that same parking configuration where people are using the road in front of what is supposed to be a very specific experience. Um, so obviously the essential wellness center has some different hours as to when the games are going to happen. And sometimes I think lost in the shuffle of this is not too far away is an entire high school parking lot. Now it's not super convenient as it is designed today to go from all of those empty spots down to the arena, but it would not take a Herculean effort to make that part of the experience as well. And so there's discussions afoot about how do we leverage the resources that are already there that maybe even feel a little bit further away, but aren't and turn them into part of the experience as well. Yep. So the question is, with, does this current design do anything negative toward the outdoor rinks? And the reality is, not only does it not, it likely is able to enhance them. Um, so we won't lose any of the outdoor rinks, um, both for this or for parking in terms of that, but it may help in terms of configuration and being a smarter design all the way through. No, no and those that's a really important question, I think, that maybe folks aren't bringing up because a lot of the not only Hermantown specific, but when people think about hockey in Minnesota, their their picture is, you know, these little rink rats who grow up and become these incredible folks and they do it on these somewhat wonderful, somewhat unforgiving outdoor rinks. Um, and especially here, we have a reputation for leveraging that resource, you know, both for hockey growth, but character growth and all kinds of incredible experiences for kids. And so no, those aren't in jeopardy of, of going away at all. In fact, we're hoping that the spillover allows them to be even a little bit nicer. No, that. No, the big gray square is the current rank, and the new arena. It, yes, yeah. As Eric mentioned, this particular diagram has that presumption. We do have other diagrams that Eric has worked on where the presumption is it's on the other side. Yep. And in those cases, to answer the question, then it reconfigures uh, the outdoor rinks even further um, and moves them into different locations. But at this point, both the discussions we've had with the school district is that this is probably, I mean, we wouldn't be presenting it if this wasn't the spot that we wanted to do it. 
makes sense. If the school board comes back and says that building is not moving and staying, then we can pivot to the west one and then we move those uh, outdoor rinks accordingly. But again, there'll still be four, is it four, Dave, outdoor rinks that are there? Six right now. So, Yeah, and again, that's yep. Yeah, and so for folks at home, the question is: is there's also a design that folks have seen both in public meetings at the school and here, where the design that's on the screen right now is is literally flipped. So the, the gray box, the existing arena stays in the same place. And then the new sheet of ice ends up on the other side of it. And Eric, if you want to speak a little bit to that design, and it's already in existence, it's just a matter of, for us, if, if the school board feels comfortable and they want that particular building and the admin building to stay put, then it's on the other side. And again, that's not going to come at the expense of of the six outdoor rinks, it just comes as a change. Yep. Now. Yep. Yep. Those are those are those pictures. That that design piece exists too. And uh, and in essence, really, to be honest, that's part of when I go back to as we've worked together, both the school and uh, the city, to be able to maintain a high level of flexibility for the school to be able to say, this is what really works best for us. And that can be a administration building on, I'm terrible with directions, we'll say on the Ugstad Road side of the uh, new arena or on the non-Ugstad Road side of the arena or as part of the arena or not on that side at all. So we've tried and we'll continue to maintain a high level of flexibility for them, you know, for the school board to be able to say, our administration building fits best here. Any other questions? Sales tax questions. Yep. Yeah. And so let me, I'm going to boil your question down to what I hope is the nuts and bolts of it, which is it, one of the TBD but flexible questions is what rules and regulations are in place that govern the school as to who owns both the land and the arena um, and going forward? And that's a spot where we'll work together with the school and I've continued to get their clear answer to because they're, the rules that govern, I, I do not envy the school's task in where they are governed, where their money can go in terms of being able to you know, run referendums for schools, for ice time, for all kinds of different things. And so in essence, the easiest way to think about this is a $10.84 million opportunity regardless of pictures exists for hockey and the school in our community. And that's gonna be the city's contribution. If that opportunity comes forward and makes sense to be on top of land owned by the school, that works perfectly. If the opportunity exists for the school to say, all right, as part of that, why doesn't the both arenas be run by one entity, a joint powers, the school as the current one is, the city, also works fantastic. Part of what is the good negative of the bonding bill not going forward is that bonding bill, which would have added $4 million to this project, which is fantastic and certainly much needed, would have had stipulations about that for the city. And we no longer have those strings attached. So as long as, so we have a lot of flexibility to meet those requirements 
as laid out by the school. So the question is if that in a in a I believe if I use your term correctly, a mythical world, magical or mythical, it would be both. Yeah, if a special session happened and we'll say after the election in the next year. Yeah, then it it, it is it, it's not irrelevant, but it's a different set of circumstances because that property and that ownership and how that operates would have already been decided. So part of the delays and the process to find out what works right. Is way it was waiting to find out about bonding, and now it's an opportunity, kind of like Heather mentioned, like what is the absolute best setup for this to exist for our school district? What is the absolute best setup to also support whatever their needs are going forward on their administration building? Um, I think that. Yeah, so the question from the audience was the timeline for ironing all those types of things out. Some of that is, you know, people would say, out, you know, the election day is November 8th. That's going to be what decides it. Um, in reality, the opportunity to make that fit best is going to be driven by two calendars. One is going to be to be able to, to have the school take the time that they need to be able to determine what fits best, i.e. their administration building. And if the calendar moves faster than that, that may close one or two doors, an east or a west choice, but it may open other ones across the street uh, at the uh, Central Wellness Center. There's property available. Uh, there are different sections that they're looking at as a whole. It doesn't even have to be on this particular piece of property. If the, let me wrap back to your question. So at that point, if there was bonding around the idea of adding additional support to this building, that bonding would already know who the owner is. Uh, in some ways, I would smile and say, we hope that the right folks see this and then want, because every community wants bonding for everything. Um, but the reality is, is that would be great if it, it worked out that way, whether we were talking about an arena, whether we were talking about trails, whether we were talking about Fickner Park, whether we were talking about all the different things that communities are hoping for. It's it's kind of been a, a challenging time. And and, and again, with the expectation that a sales or a special session is a zero possibility right now, there'll definitely be, um, you know, some different types of legislation coming up next session because of that. Any other questions for us tonight? For both the folks online uh, watching this, um, today's the 21st of September. You are likely to see both uh, from my actions and the folks on the city side that we will be a lot more out and about. Information sessions will be less formal uh, than this one. Um, you can find on our website at hermantownmn.com backslash vote. Uh, all the places where we'll be doing tabling information sessions starting as soon as tomorrow and the next day at uh, two Hermantown High School events. Um, and then there are open dates on the calendar. So if there are groups who would like uh, me to come out and be able to talk specifically to them uh, about this as it continues to progress, um, I'm welcome to be scheduled to run around and do kind of some of these information sessions in different spots in the community. The goal is that when you walk into the uh, ballot booth and make your vote on November 8th, that you are clear on what you're voting for, uh, you're comfortable and confident, and you have an understanding of both what it means to fill out yes or no on these bubbles and the impact of it. Um, and there are plenty of folks we know in the community who are still uh, working toward that understanding. So lots of opportunities between now and November 8th to be able to do that. Also knowing that uh, early voting starts even this Friday. So lots of education to happen. Uh, and if folks have questions, they can always reach out to me at City Hall. Otherwise, thanks for being here tonight, everybody. Appreciate it. <laughs>